Tālō for lava, tēnā koutou katoa, Pacific Greetings. I'm um, Marilyn Kohesi, I'm one of, the, um, one of the council members, and we are absolutely delighted after, after, after oh. two years, because we've been trying to get this conversation off the ground in person for, um, during COVID, so we're absolutely delighted to see you all here um, this afternoon for, we think it's a, a, a historic occasion because um, Conversazioni were a very fundamental part of the Auckland Museum Institute um, some hundred, several hundred years ago. <laughs> so Marguerite has taken advantage of um, COVID to do an enormous amount of work, uh, research work, um, uh, Marguerite can tell us a little bit more about that, but bringing this together has been quite a feat and she's had significant support from and input from um, Elizabeth Lorimer from here from the library. I'd especially like to, um, to welcome you all here as AMI members and without further ado, I will hand over to um, Marguerite During who is, we're very, very delighted, has put all this time into capturing cool. and sharing this uh, valuable, yeah. interesting information with us. Thank you, thank you. And just remember that this is the conversazione, so please feel free if you've got something to say, questions to ask. If you're too far away down there, there's seats further around. Um, this is the first time we've done this, so please tell me if we can improve things or, or um, make things a little bit better and more comfortable for you. But, um, yeah, that worked. Um, the Documentary Heritage Department here holds a huge amount of amazing handwritten materials documents and diaries and letters, um, some of which have been coming to light because of the current um, digitisation programme at the museum. Um, they're trying to get everything or as much as they can on um, computer these days. So earlier this year I was asked to do a transcript of a series of handwritten and illustrated stories from the 1880s and 1890s. And we will see the originals uh, shortly. These stories turned out to be amazingly entertaining, and, but exactly who E.M. and C. Cheeseman were really piqued my interest. The only one I know is Thomas Cheeseman, of course. Um, and me being me, I'm very easily diverted. And it turned out that Ellen and Clara Cheeseman turned out to be Thomas's sisters. So there's a backstory here, and I wanted to find out what it was. So this is the Thomas Cheeseman that we're all probably familiar with um, when he was curator at the Auckland Museum. But what was his background? Did he have any siblings? And how did they get to New Zealand? didn't intend this to be a deep dive into the family history, but I just wanted to know a little bit more about the whole family setup. You know, with never more than three staff members at the museum, Thomas Cheeseman was assisted at time by at least three of his four siblings. How many museum staff members have we got today? somewhere around about 300, plus 280 volunteers. So to start right at the beginning, this is the Cheeseman family home at Hull in Yorkshire, where Thomas and his three sisters were born. This photograph was taken um, after the family had left. Uh, the roof that you can see at the back, the bare rafters, are actually uh, was where a bomb fell during the war. So uh, this just gives you a little feeling of where the Cheeseman family came from. 
doesn't and look as if it's a very big house. No, there weren't. <laughs> two up and two down very often. Yes. Small um, Coronation Street type of, uh, houses. So this is the father, Thomas Cheeseman Senior. He was born in 1815 and his mother um, influenced strongly Thomas and his brother to become primitive Methodist ministers. I found out that Thomas was actually singled out in the church minutes as the only minister to be not conforming to their rules. <laughs> <laughs> and a note explains why. Uh, what, what's a primitive Methodist? It sounds rather... Primitive Methodist oh, okay. stuck to the basics as far as I understand oh, okay. it. Very simple and straightforward and no elaboration of things. It was a break away from the Anglicans. It oh. was, yeah. Were they, were they the ones who, who said no class, no music, no... Yeah, they're the, the ones, part, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So we find a note in the, in the minutes of his church saying that in consequence of Brother Cheeseman's hair having fallen off, he puts it on top of his head. But if the district meeting decidedly objects to his method, he promises to adhere to the rules, he being subject to taking colds in his head. So I do hope that the district meeting showed some compassion to this young man. With his I'm sure the church was never heated, nor his house very much. Um, family came out to New Zealand um, partly because they hoped the climate here would cure a throat ailment that he suffered from. And they came out on a bark called the Artemisia. Artemisia, just as an aside, is actually a large, diverse genus of plants with between 200 and 400 species belonging to the daisy family. And our Thomas, or Tom as he was usually known, actually discovered a tree daisy in Rarotonga some years later. As some of Thomas's wife's Corkwell family also travelled out with them, uh, and he was described as the Reverend Thomas Cheeseman. Here he is later on with his two grandchildren, Tom's two children. And he became involved in public affairs. He also helped his son Tom look after the museum when Tom was away on his frequent botanising trips. And he taught the one temporary staff member, Charles de Campanier, how to take rainfall readings on the museum roof. And that was one of the most important things that the museum did in those days. If you look through some of the early correspondence to the museum, people were always asking for rainfall data. <laughs> why, why do you think they were? Why? Why? Yeah. Um, I don't Trying to grow crops and things. Yeah, probably because people were setting up farms and wanting to yeah. grow crops and wanting some background information. I wonder if it's useful today to compare with our modern day rainfall. Um, Charles de Campanier didn't last very long because he was employed as a taxidermist and the museum very quickly ran out of funds to pay him. This is the oldest girl. This is Emma, second child and oldest girl. Um, and after the museum had difficulty in finding a taxidermist, she actually learned um, the profession. A lot of the birds and things that we have here today from the early collections have her name and details of having prepared them. Uh, Victorian women were generally excluded from scientific botany, but they were often members of small enthusiastic societies, like the <coughs> Museum Institute. Um, and when Thomas Cheeseman became a founding secretary of the Auckland Naturalist Field Club, his sisters also 
became members. This is Clara. She didn't look very happy about having her first portrait taken, but <laughs> she was the third child and second daughter. She's a talented writer, as we will just soon discover. And she actually wrote a novel called The Rolling Stone. <laughs> I wonder if we can get a copy of that. Um, the older photograph of her is taken outside her father's house. Very often the youngest daughter in a family was kept at home to look after mum and dad later in life. And that may well have happened to Clara. She still doesn't look very happy about it. <laughs> and the other daughter was Ellen, Nellie. And I haven't been able to find a photograph of her and she doesn't appear to have married. Um, but she was a talented artist and these, some of the watercolours that she did of plants. Um, if you could just imagine, there was no colour photography in those days, for example. Um, so unless you could collect an actual um, piece. Even if you did press flowers, you very often lost the colours mm -hmm. and the dimensions and depth. Yes, I wondered where they got their colours from. Yeah. She was a member of the New Zealand Naturalist Society and went on field trips with the groups, painting landscapes from Thames River to Coromandel. And her art was also published in the Naturalist Society's journal. But here's the big thing. This is one example of her paintings, and I think we might have lost a bit of definition here. Um, sea slugs. This was done because it was impossible to preserve their colours. If you put a type specimen in alcohol or a preserving material, it very often bleached all the colour out of it and slugs being what they are very often curl up um, when you put them in a preserving material. Um, for a long time these became the type specimen. Normally a type specimen is the actual thing but with sea slugs and things you can't do that. A type specimen is used as the gold standard when a species is newly recognised and described. So these are particularly important specimens for researchers and the museum has a few thousand across the natural history collection. These are kept separately under lock and key and we're not going to see them today. Mother, From, I think they're called a conotypes. Yes, type of yes, thank you, they are. Uh, for mollusks, it's relatively easy to create a type specimen. Um, if it's got hard parts, such as a shell, <coughs> however, when they're soft bodied, bodied, such as sea slugs, then it becomes harder because it's much more difficult to preserve soft tissue. And in many cases, the original specimen has been lost. And this happens to be the case for Ecclesia. Glauca, now known as Bursatella lichii, or to put it in my terms, it's the feathery seahorse, which no longer exists today. So Emma Cheesman's painting is the only record we have of the original specimen on which Cheesman based his species name. And I'm sorry, but that image is not yet digitised. Wilma Blom tells me that the value of Emma's paintings is that she created a permanent record of specimens which are highly ephemeral because they record characteristics such as colours, gills and proportions when the animal is alive because preservation mediums like alcohol destroy colours. And even now we can't preserve colours and gills and body proportions and they're often highly distorted when specimens are preserved. So Wilma tells me they try to photograph specimens before they are pickled. That's her word. 
What would be the scale on that? I mean, are they are they six meters across or? Oh, six oh, millimeters. six <laughs> millimeters would be more like it, I think. Uh, okay. six, six. Oh, that's small. They're not huge. No, okay. Um, do they do they not put scale on on the? They would do, they would do, but okay. to show you this image, I haven't got the scale okay, here, I'm sorry. And this is a younger brother, Willie. He was the only child born in New Zealand shortly after they arrived in New Zealand. He's noted as a natural history collector and a building contractor. Those two go well together. Uh, he, did, he was a great shooter and he collected hundreds of bird specimens that were added to the Auckland Museum collection by his brother Tom. Um, and Emma prepared many of those specimens and you can see their initials on some of the tags even today. And this is how these iconotype specimens are stored. They're not like the beautifully prepared to put on display specimens are. But even today you get places like the customs at the airport wanting to know somebody's imported a bird, can we compare it? And the museum will work with them to see if they can identify something. So this is our Thomas. He was always known in the family as Tom. He was educated at the Church of England Grammar School in Parnell, just up the road here. Um, and at St John's College. I found two early photographs of the college, but I couldn't find a childhood photograph of Tom. So here he is taking after his father with a bald head. Um, by the time the Auckland University College was opened, he was already a recognised botanist uh, in his own right. Oh, and he, was, he would have been older than all of the professors. Uh, possibly. Um, but when the Cheeseman family arrived in Auckland in 1854, an eight-year-old Thomas is said to have rushed forward to collect a tree fern frond growing on the foreshore. So right from the very first day in New Zealand, botany became a family passion. And ferns, of course, in Victorian times were very fashionable. Uh, but you can imagine the excitement of the family with all the new species to discover in their new home. Reverend John Kinder was the first um, headmaster uh, and he looked after Tom right until he went to St John's School. Uh, in 1869, a rival school was established, um, and by this time, the Auckland Grammar School and the Church of England School, now known as Parnell Grammar School, uh, continued to draw their pupils from church, professional, and business families. There were also Maori pupils. Um, during this time, the school had become more outward looking, playing sport with its new rivals and moving more towards study of sciences and less traditional subjects. And two visiting teachers at that time uh, helped with these trends and one was T.F. Cheeseman and the other one was Kenneth Watkins, a well-known Auckland artist. No early photographs again. Very frustrating. And the school was on the corner of Air Street. And yes, and Kinder House is yes, where the headmaster lived. Yes. yes. So we're moving on a bit here now to 1873, and this is Thomas's application to uh, apply for the job of curator at the museum. Very polite. Sir, I have the honour to apply for the situation of secretary of the Auckland Institute and curator of the museum, an office which I believe is now vacant. He says, for the last 10 years, I've given the whole of my leisure time to the study of natural sciences and made large collections in various branches, especially botany. 
On January the 3rd, 1874, the minutes of the Institute show that they had received five applications and they agreed to appoint Mr Cheeseman as secretary and collector. Was there any information on the other applicants? No. <laughs> no. I um, I the was... museum may well have collect, uh, kept the letters. There's one thing the museum never throws away is letters that have been written. So we could fish them out and see who they were. Do you think somebody might have been better qualified? <laughs> no, I was mean, just thinking that perhaps there was another applicant who, you know, didn't compare to him, but perhaps in 20 years became director at another museum. Oh, very likely. Um, yeah, yeah. No, there were, there were no um, applicants. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, jeez. That's good heart. He was doing his best, but he didn't have the uh, command of the skills that he brought to the museum. And we didn't keep those applications. It's actually illegal to keep them today. Um. Oh, well, there you go. Now we know something they do throw away. <laughs> So on the 18th of November, 1889, Thomas married Rosetta Keesing at the registry office. Rosetta, or Rosa as she was known, was the daughter of a prominent Auckland Jewish family. And the family weren't madly happy, but the marriage seems to have been a very successful one. Uh, on the bottom left here, we see Rosa with the family dog, Raki, and the family horse, Polly. Stories of Tom's punctuality uh, are renowned around Remuera. Apparently many Remuera housewives used to set their clocks by Tom going off to work on Polly in the mornings, coming home at night. Uh, Rosa and their daughter, little daughter Dorothea, uh, would be waiting for him at the gates and Dorothea would be allowed to ride up on Papa's horse back up to the house. <laughs> so here's Tom again. Um, shortly after the marriage, Thomas visited the Three Kings with his wife and she helped him collect some of the specimens. In 1899, they also visited Rarotonga, and as a result of this, um, Thomas Cheeseman's book, The Flora of Rarotonga, The Chief Islands of the Cook Islands, was published in 1903. And he produced a whole load of meticulous workbooks all of which have now been transcribed largely by me with Elizabeth's help. Uh, and they will go up online once my botanical spellings have been collect corrected. <laughs> this is one thing I've not been very good at. Rosa was said to be fearless, thinking nothing of jumping from the ship to the rocky shore, encumbered by long skirts. I don't think I'd want to do it today, even with jeans and, and appropriate shoes. So here's Tom with little Dorothea outside the family house, Mara Nui, in Remuera. This is about 1892. And here are some of his um, awards and roles that he played. Um, Writings of people that knew him at the time say that he had a reputation for patience in dealing with inquiries from young and old, and he was a skilled teacher. Photographs show that he was fully bearded, bald-headed, with a kindly face and a twinkle in his eye. He taught botany and zoology to the boys from the Church of England Grammar School in Parnell, taking them on expeditions to the to the Auckland Main Ponds and to One Tree Hill. During his early <coughs> days at the museum, he rode his horse to work. With his friend and fellow botanist, James Adams, he
He obtained notable collections from the North Cape area and also from the Nelson and Mount Cook Mountain districts. And in 1887, Cheeseman accompanied a government expedition to annex the Kermadec Islands. That is one that Rosa didn't go on and his object was reporting on the flora and fauna. But they brought with them a flagpole on the steamer and the crew marched it to the highest point in all their Sunday gear, got the resident family, father, mother, five girls and four boys, all in their Sunday best of homemade smocks, neckerchiefs and bare feet, and they assembled to take possession of the island and give three hearty cheers for the Queen. <laughs> On the return voyage, the ship called in briefly at the three King's Islands and Cheeseman was probably the first New Zealand botanist to set foot there. And here's the Cheeseman family at home at Maranui. Top left corner is their son Guy and I can't quite make out whether these are fish he's caught or birds. Perhaps he took after his uncle Willie uh, shooting birds. Looks like birds, the heads. Kind of they do look a bit like birds, don't they? Um, whether this family gathering was a wedding or a christening or just Christmas, I don't know. They made a big thing about Christmas. And here's Tom and Rosa with their two children, Guy. Does the house still exist? No, it doesn't. The house um, was sold and it was on three acres of land. Mm -hmm. For a short few years, the, um, the, who climbed up to the top of Everest? Edmund Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> Edmund all, Hillary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am getting old, you know. The Edmund Hillary family lived there for a while and actually Edmund Hillary was born at that house there. The um, family plot of three acres was finally broken up into 90, 90 housing plots. Dorothea, Dorothy, um, she retained a contact with the museum long after both her parents had gone and she was always consulted on anything to do with family papers and so on. Um, Cheeseman actually died after a heart attack in 1923, uh, after he directed the Institute and the Museum for almost 50 years. So, this is the thing that started me off on this whole saga, these books, The Field Trips by the Mrs. E. M. and C. Cheeseman. The Naturalist Field Club had day trips to most areas around Auckland. The Institute does try to carry on that tradition today. Uh, and in the early 1880s, um, the Cheeseman siblings obviously enjoyed these occasions and they made a journal of the 1882 and 1883 trips, each one of them illustrating a chapter and drawing the images. Uh, between 1882 and 1883, they had three day field trips. There was a poem about Rangitoto, and they often used nom de plumes and described the names of characters on the trips. So there's another project there to try and figure out who these characters were. One of them was Angelo Binks. And another one was Sylvester Tobias. And it's all the stories about this boat trip going out to Rakino, uh, the conversations that they had on the way. Um, Tobias and Angelo discussing the possibility of property investments, investing in money was a man's domain in those days. Um, 
and there was some idea that they might buy some land on Rakino. So this is what the pages look like. Beautiful handwriting. And you know, I discovered a few years ago that this is one thing that computers can't do, is read handwriting. Mm -hmm. But I can. <laughs> Obviously the Rakino for sure. Uh, and I wonder if that fallen tree is still there on the Rakino Wharf Beach. Any Rakinoites know that? No. no. So we'll have to organise an institute field trip out there to go and follow in the, few, in the footsteps, I think. Uh, but that could be Thomas Cheeseman in the light suit and the forked beard. And maybe Dr Arthur Purchase in the long coat alongside him to the forefront. Elizabeth and I have decided that that could be Dr Purchase, another one of our famous Auckland. Uh, and Arthur Purchase was an institute president for quite some years, I think. So Angelo Binks was a rather naughty young man who uh, seemed to want to uh, impress young ladies with his knowledge. Um, but... <laughs> Your sense of humour, didn't they? Yeah. Just like me, I can't tell a polypodium from an aspilinium, but... Um, Probably most people can't either. No, 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 oh. no. Uh, and there we see the captain of the steamer. He's delivered everybody there and he's not going to go trekking up to the top <laughs> of Rakino Hill. He's going to sit and read his newspaper. And we see some of the artists in the background there. But those seagulls look awfully large to me on the, in the bay. A little bit out of proportion, perhaps. And we've left one poor fellow in a flax bush stuck <laughs> fast. And he said he was fixed just the same way when he was at Rakino before. I think he left his spectacles there. Maybe the second time he was going to look for his spectacles. And poor old Mr Parables, you know him, don't you? Well, I don't, was halfway up when he was seized with palpitations and had to lie down under a tree. They said he went to sleep under there. <laughs> and you see Mr Cheeseman there or somebody who's been collecting seeds probably of some awful <laughs> weed, which he'll now take back on his clothes to the mainland. And not everybody, of course, went there to go botanising. Some of them actually went fishing. And there seemed to be no limit to the fishing catching <laughs> those days. Oh, and this is so funny. One of the girls was a great poet and although the writer claims that this poet had not written the poet, poem about her, if you scan through the poem it's telling her, do change your seat and face the other way, the prospect is so sweet. It's a very curious thing as every landman knows that when you're pulling from the shore you don't look to the bows. So they arrived home at a very late hour. Um, this image here finishes off this particular story and it's telling the story of the kettle, which is quite a long story. And it's written in poems form. And this kettle Whoever owned the cattle carried it with him everywhere he went and it's been around the world with the owner on various adventures that he had. But here, when he tried to boil the kettle in the boiler of the steamer, it burnt a hole right through the kettle. So the kettle had to be consigned to a watery grave. And there ends so many stories that we have. This is the Rangitoto poem. Can you just imagine hiking all the way up to Rangitoto in Victorian clothes and Victorian shoes? And without a trail? 
and without much of a trail. And this was before the regeneration had taken place, so there wasn't much shade or shelter. And no lovely wooden steps? No. So part of the poems... Sorry? Hopefully in the winter time, not the summer. I haven't got a date on that one, yeah, hopefully. I've got a flag at the top. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Tattered, Sorry, battered, <laughs> sick and sore, with worn out boots, their labours o'er. They stand. Oops. Let's go back. They stand upon the crater's brink. Admire the view and sadly think, guess what, it is fine, but after all this pain, we surely must go down again. <laughs> the next trip was to South Head and Huia. And on that trip, you could have a choice of getting off at who you spend the day or carrying on to um, South Head. And his sisters never, ever missed an opportunity to bring their high status brother down a step or two. So the attractions, the pretty bay of Huia came into sight first and some of the excursionists had a long discussion about whether the show should stay or go on. The attractions of the Huya were well known, but very few on board could say anything about South Head. It might be a paradise. Oh. Did they go by sea to Huya? Yes. Yes. I just thought the previous one talked about a train. No, um, Where was the train to what, what I thought was that drawing of Cheeseman and Mr Pond, I couldn't figure out whether they were walking along a boardwalk or whether it was a train track. The secretary hinted that it might be a paradise, but from the distance it looked like a bare sandy hill. The secretary, this is Tom Cheeseman, feebly put in a few words on behalf of the latter place, but it was in vain he pleaded that the way was not long, the hill high, nor the sand troublesome. That clear gushing streams, giant trees, ferns and knee cows were quite common. No one believed him. His ideas of distance and height were known to be hazy, and besides everyone was aware that he had a preference for forms of vegetation which were stunted scraggery, scraggy, and retiring in their habits. So the majority decided in face of, favour of the Huia, but a few on board decided to go with him to South Head. Time flew fast, and so did the Hannah. Her engines being in good working order, and so did the cook who was preparing a dinner. So, as per usual on these trips, the botanists forgot to botanise, the geologists did not seek to pry into the domestic affairs of Mother Earth, and there was no beetle hunting. It was only necessary to state that a botanist whom it would be uncharitable to name, guess who, carried about all day an empty collecting bag. But finally they arrived at the signal master's house uh, and he was there to welcome them to the smallest lighthouse in the country. And there he invited them into his house to enjoy uh, some light refreshments. And it was noted there were pictures on the walls of his house, particularly a portrait of Queen Victoria, who was of stern and forbidding countenance possibly because she was scandalised at having been placed next to Beatrice Chenchi, who was a fine-looking lady in a turban. So who the heck's Beatrice Chenchi? Well, she was a young Roman noblewoman who was murdered, 
who murdered her abusive father, what? Count Francesco Cenci. She was condemned and beheaded for the crime in 1599. <laughs> the subsequent lurid murder trial in Rome gave rise to an enduring legend about her. Not quite sure whether it was the right thing for a Victorian sitting room, but there it was. Mary, can I ask a geography question? Are we talking about Potapu here, or are we talking about the northern Arthitu Peninsula? I think it must have been Arfitu because they went to where the um, lighthouse was. There was a lighthouse. The lighthouse used to be on um, Watapu. Yeah. Yeah. On Watapu? Yeah. And the signalman's house was up on the top of the hill there. Then that's where it would be. They don't describe it here, but that's where it would but be. They talk about the bare sandy cliffs, and that would be the other, the other side. Yeah. 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 So it's interesting. It was mighty to climb that, because <laughs> it's no small hill. Yeah. Not there Sandy now, but it was. So time to head for home, and they ran out of time. They they lost track of time. Maybe somebody hadn't taken a watch with them. I don't know. You notice this drawing here looks to have been done in a different hand to a lot of the other paintings and drawings. Yeah. It's a much more hurried sketch. Yeah. So uh, maybe Tom did that himself, I don't know. Uh, but that's obviously him with his um, botany bag on his back and Mr Pond with his geology hammer over his shoulder. Oh, what happened when they got back down to the hill on onto the boat? The Hannah's stuck on a sandbank. It can't get it off. This is where the real fun and games started. The captain, first of all, got everybody to go to the back of the ship to see if they could uh, release the front of the ship. No such luck. So he got everybody running from side to side. And they claim that, with few exceptions, men and women of substance he ordered them forward and the crew of the Hannah following with ponderous tread. An <laughs> immense lightning of the steamer at the stern was perceptible, but still she clung to the sandbank. So they rolled her. Did they heck? So then he put her cable out. No mobile phones in these days to let the guys at the Huia know what was happening. No even signals. They tried to hawser it off, but instead of pulling the ship off, they pulled the trees out of the sandbank. <laughs> they broke a giant rock in true. And there they were stuck, waiting for the tide to come in. And the tide wasn't due in for several hours. It must be the Arfiji side because it looks like Kuponga Point in the background. Sounds like it. Yeah. You, you, I don't think I've ever been there. That's another institute trip, Marilyn. I'm making notes. <laughs> <laughs> so then they tried lighting a signal fire. Well, this was late summer. They could have had the whole of South Head ablaze if they hadn't been careful. Um, No, oh, yeah. so the who is? No, that's on the other side. So there was someone on the other side. Because yeah. there was a wall. There's still a wall, isn't there? A wall yeah. on one side that one. Mm. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, some wet roses. There's also a wall for here. Yeah, there's a wall for here. And a poor cook. He's trying to feed these people. Trying to keep them supplied with cups of tea for all these hours when they're waiting. And he had four cups and saucers for all of those people on board. <laughs> So if he wasn't pouring out tea, he was rinsing out cups and saucers. But they've got mutton chops and potatoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> By 10 o'clock, the Hana was gently agitated off the rising tide. And finally, the Huia party was rescued. The naturalist, of course, is Tom Cheeseman again. 
not wearing sackcloth and cowering in his cabin. But the adventure wasn't over. It was one o'clock in the morning by the time they got back to Only Hunger. And the busman wasn't very keen about being woken up and asked us <laughs> to harness his horses. These were horse-drawn buses in those days. Can't call an Uber. I mean, what an end to a day out. Even the secretary's offer of extra pay didn't persuade the bus driver to saddle his horses. But he strode off. He decided he'd walk home. Couldn't be late for work the next morning. Unless everybody else to either beg a bed for the night at Only Hunger or to follow his lead and walk home. Um, young Alcides is the name for young Hercules. So whether this is somebody's grandson or son, I'm not too sure. But wow, what an adventure. Can we do some more field trips like that? <laughs> so did his sisters walk home too? I assume so. <laughs> So when they weren't going on field trips, the family were preparing um, Christmas annuals. Um, each year they did a different Christmas annual. There was no television, not really any radio. So you made your own entertainment for the Christmas holidays. And they prepared these beautiful annuals. Um, Clara and Nellie were particularly meticulous in doing these things. And um, we've got copies of the 1904 and 1905 annual. Um, and this is the introduction to 1905. Again, they often use nom de plumes and Tommy's torpedo cruise written by old Wackham you see a picture of a very young old Wackham they cut out images from magazines to uh, maintain anonymity but we know that old Wackham was actually Tom Cheeseman who the other ones were we still have to work out Mater was probably Rosa Cheeseman. They each contributed a story. Can you have so much fun at Christmas time, don't they? Instead of trawling around the shopping malls buying stuff, they just create a family album. <laughs> Only residents of Maranui were permitted to read the stories and contributors were all close family and friends. They're full of short stories, puzzles, plays, and jokes. Is so, that's down the bottom of the pond, isn't oh. it? Yes. That's the bridge. Yeah. yeah. That's the railway over bridge. Yeah. And the hotel. Yeah. And this is a story, a play. It's got Brighton Road, I can read. Policeman referring cautiously, peering cautiously out of his hiding place. Well, I never <laughs> could there could the oh, I can't quite see it could could it well I never did their mere children too. Lord knows what they were up to. I still have to transcribe these. Nearly finished. So I have some copies of those links if anybody would like to um have those. Some of these stories will go up on um, the website here, but they're kind of sitting in a queue waiting to get put up there at the moment. I have one or two of the type transcripts that anybody's welcome to have if they wish. And I'd love to hear any contributions that anybody else has. But Elizabeth and Martin are going to bring out for us now and have a look at 
the originals. And if people want to come and have a look down here. More? If you go on the Secrets Museum tour down to the basement, they have put a whole display of early labels up by the elevator there to have a look at. All beautifully calligraphy written and just divine. It would be really fun to take some of the images out to Huia and see whether you can recognise some of the landmarks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the men, the, the first trip out to Rakino, they went home on the train and some of them had to stand on the platform because there's no seats left and all the soot coming down on What an amazing job you've done. Oh, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Some of them, we don't know the difference, unfortunately. I think some, the very scratchy ones, will be Cheeseman himself. Oh, um, and there are, yeah, Clara, Clara and Emma and possibly even Ellen. Yes, could um, be. Because I there is ve some very um, kind of pretty, kind of um, quite accomplished yeah. paintings yeah, yeah. and quite sketchy ones as well. Yeah. <laughs> See, here's old Wackham again. <laughs> old Wackham was very often a nickname for the teacher or headmaster because he was the one with the cane. Margarita's um, a very valued volunteer here at the museum. 
and we really, it, I should have introduced her as our Vice President, um, and we're very delighted that she has done all this work, and it was really great to see how interested everybody was in, in her presentation. We, we um, do have other, um, two other conversazioni planned for the rest of the year, and they won't all be in this format of um, sitting in the library. Uh, Ros Curry is going to take us on a little bit of a tour around the museum and talk about some of the significant rooms and some of the significant pieces. And um, Marguerite, I think you were also going to do a, a history of the Museum Institute. Well, I, it, it's the Museum Institute minute books. That's Yes, which is kind of like bringing together a history. Going back to year blob. Yeah. Uh, before it was the Museum and Institute, there's even a minute book from when it was just the Auckland Museum and the caretaker, I won't call him curator, was constantly writing to say that he couldn't cope with all the moths. There's no point in bringing me any more artifacts because the moths are eating them <laughs> faster than I can display them. Uh -huh. So there will be some fantastic anecdotes yeah, yeah. that will come yeah. um, via the minutes. But if you've got any um, immediate feedback on some, some of the things that you'd like us to do uh, in terms of conversazione, uh, if you want to email us or um, tell Marguerite or myself or Scott, we're really interested to get feedback from members and um, we hope that this is the beginning of um, a period of uh, more face-to-face -face activity. So I'd just like to thank everybody for coming.